on Business Incorporated today. Africa's Continental Free Trade Initiative receives financial support from the UK. World Bank approves $560 million for reforms in Angola. And Egypt to secure wheat supplies from France in coming months. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ebang. First, the markets trading on the African continent kicked off the midweek with mostly negative sentiments at intraday. Nigeria's main index rose 0.1%, while South Africa's benchmark index fell 0.03% at intraday. Elsewhere, Egypt's index also traded lower by 0.54% at intraday, while the Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Tuesday's negative session down by 0.01%. Over to the Middle East, where sentiments were also mostly in the red at intraday, the Abu Dhabi index fell 0.61%, while Dubai rose by 0.3%. Still within the region, Saudi Arabia's and the Qatari indexes both declined by 0.6% each at intraday. Now, to, over to Europe, where Europe pursues its quest to replace Russian energy. There's also concern Europe's gas supplies could be disrupted as a deadline for them to switch to paying Russia in rubles approaches amid peace talks. We have Rob standing by with more details in Berlin. Hello, Rob. What impact have the latest developments in the Russia-Ukraine peace talks had on markets in Europe? Well, on Tuesday, we saw European stocks rally after what were interpreted as by investors uh, as positive signals from the talks in Turkey. Russia said that it would scale down its military operations around two Ukrainian cities, including the capital, Kiev. Despite a huge amount of scepticism surrounding that announcement, investors appeared willing to take Moscow at its word. We saw a big jump to European indexes. The DAX rose 2.8% during Tuesday in Frankfurt. In Paris, the CAC 40 was up 3%, and as was the uh, pan-European Stocks 50 index. Now, those markets were also willing to shrug off worse-than-expected consumer confidence data from both Germany and France. And in reaction to the developments in the Ukraine-Russia talks, we also saw a drop in oil prices, with Brent crude dipping by $2 a barrel. The optimism carried over onto US and Asian markets. It will be interesting now to see how that holds out during the course of Wednesday, after a night of considering whether this really is a concession from Russia at all. Mm, we'll continue to watch that. But Germany has activated an emergency plan to secure its gas supplies. What does that mean? Yes, this came as a surprise from Econ Economy Minister Robert Harbeck. Uh, he activated this emergency plan. He, however, stressed that this was not because the supply of gas was currently a risk. There is enough to go around. However, there's clearly growing concern in the German government that that could soon be the case. Minister Habeck said that Germany must be, as he put it, prepared in the event of an escalation on the part of Russia. So he's quite clearly there putting this across as a, a reaction to Russia's behaviour, not because of talk of Germany itself blocking imports of Russian gas. So this is uh, the first level of three crisis levels that he's instigating, and it doesn't provide for any government restrictions on gas usage, but it does start Germany off in a process that could escalate if the German government thinks it's necessary. In the meantime, German households and businesses are being urged by their government to use as little gas as they can. Well, Russia is doubling down on its insistence that Europe must pay for gas in rubles. What's the latest on this? 
Yes, well, this is really what Robert Habeck's announcement is all about. You may remember last week, President Putin himself announced that Russia would be forcing what he called unfriendly countries to pay for Russian gas in rubles instead of euros or dollars. It's part of an effort to support the ruble, which has lost 40% of its value since the Ukraine war began. The countries Putin was referring to were those who have imposed sanctions on Russia since the invasion of Ukraine. So primarily, that does affect Europe. His announcement was initially ridiculed by the governments of Germany and France, who said it was simply unworkable. But we're now less than a day away from the deadline Moscow set for it to formulate the practical arrangements for that policy to take effect. And the Kremlin simply hasn't backed down. Spokesperson Dmitry Peskov told reporters yesterday that, quote, no one will supply gas for free. It's simply impossible. And you can pay for it only in rubles. Well, he was basically saying that European countries are not going to have an option on this. Now, EU countries argue that Russia has no right to redraw the contracts, which are in euros and dollars, and the G7 has urged companies not to agree to switch to rubles. So the two sides are very far apart on this. And if they don't reach agreement soon, the question is, what happens to Europe's gas supplies? And that's a question that we do not yet know the answer to. Hmm. We'll wait and see how that question, who answers that question, Rob. Thank you so much, Rob. Always good to talk to you. Now we move to Asia, where shares in Asia Pacific were largely higher on Wednesday as mainland Chinese stocks led gains regionally. Mainland China Shanghai Composite climbed 1.96% on the day, while the Shenzhen Composite component rose 3.1%. Hong Kong's broader Hang Seng Index jumped 1.39% to close. Elsewhere, South Korea's Kofsby advanced 0.21%, and in Australia, the S&P and ASX 200 climbed 0.67 to end the trading day. Meanwhile, Japanese stocks lagged the broader region as the Nikkei 225 slipped 0.8% to close. Over to the U.S., where U.S. equities futures dipped slightly early on Wednesday after stocks extended their rally in the previous session, even as fears of an inverted yield curve sparked recession concerns and investors continued watching developments play out in Ukraine. Futures tied to the Dow Industrial Jones average, Dow Jones Industrial average slipped by 0.2 percent, S&P 500 futures fell 0.28 percent, and Nasdaq 100 futures lost 0.4 percent. Meanwhile, let's take a peek at yesterday's trading activity. Our correspondent, Mario Bird, gives us a summary. The U.S. stock market ended in the green on Tuesday as it's on track to end the month in the green, the first time in almost a year. The Dow Jones was up 0.96%. The S&P 500 up 1.22%. And the Nasdaq up 1.84%. The U.S. stock market is on the rise as the oil prices are on the decline the first time in over a week. U.S. investors are hopeful that this is a trend for stabilization of the U.S. economy. Thank you, Maria. We move quickly to East Africa, where the East African community has officially admitted the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo, DRC, marking historic event in the trade bloc. The DRC becomes the seventh and newest member of the community, which comprises Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and South Sudan. The inclusion of DRC Congo's consumer markets of close to 90 million people We expand the EAC market to almost 300 million people and open the block to the Congolese economy, which is rich in all kinds of natural resources. I have joining me to talk about this, Mercy Milanoi, business journalist in Kenya. Hello, um, Mercy, it's always good to speak to you. Hello, how are you? Hi, this is history in the making. However, what immediate change will we see, will this uh, admission to the EAC bring to the block? Well, it is quite a historical move, and um, I remember during even during the um, the summit, the meeting where this decision was made and this announcement was made by the chair, President Uru Kenyatta, presidents like um, Yuri Museveni are actually saying that they've been waiting the RC to be a member of East Africa community for almost 60 years. 
So it's been a, quite a long journey coming. And of course, for the East African community, it's simply to tap on to the market that SADAC, the South African Development Community, has been tapping on. As you rightly put it, um, DRC hosts a population of over 90 million, um, 90 million people. That's quite a huge market that the East African community is looking to tap. And of course, even the export worth is about 2 billion, which actually SADAC has been benefiting all these years. So it's quite a commendable move that has been welcomed by all members of states of the East African community to have DRC on board. Of course, it's not only to just look at, look at it as an export market, but also uh, looking at to see how we can be able to also benefit um, from the products from DRC, which of course include gold, diamond, copper. It's quite um, a huge country with natural resources. And even right now, as ESC is looking to you know, ratify and look at making ways of exports and imports among member countries easier the east african community is quite looking forward to see how they can be able to also to tap um, into drc's products of course at a friendly price and at a friendly rate um, even as the esc looks to um, ratify and of, of course standardize um, taxes and imports and exports to make sure that business um, it's quite friendly for all the countries to trade with each other oh that's really good so what does uh, kenya stand to gain from this inclusion in the block what is the benefit for kenya we have seen um, the president, the deputy president, of course, um, visiting uh, DRC not once, not twice. And of course, even um, the DRC head of state um, visiting Kenya. Now, currently, um, of course, Kenya, our main exports um, to, to DRC include animal products, milk, um, tobacco. If you can just run you through the numbers, as at 2020, um, Kenya exported tobacco worth 20.39 million USD. Um, iron and steel worth 17.07 .07 million USD. Um, sugar and sugar confectionery and also products worth 9.04 million USD. And of course, food, footwear, among other footwear products, um, worth 8.29 million USD. So you see, um, Kenya is normally known for exporting food products, flowers, you know, and the like, and multicultural products. But you see, for GRC, it's quite different. Um, you're looking to export finished products, and of course, in iron, steel, and the footwear, which is quite huge. And of course, this is quite a market that Kenya is looking to tap into. Um, of course, even with the heads of state interactions, we are also expecting to see uh, maybe some, some, tree, some, some, um, some trade agreements being made in order to tap into each other country's um, resources, both in products and also in service. So of course, it's quite a big win, especially for Kenya and looking at um, for the manufacturing um, sector and also uh, not only for Kenya, but even the East African community are looking to tap into the Africa Free Trade Agreement. And of course, even in light of this, DRC is also expected to deposit the instrument of ratification before 29th September. So, of course, even as, um, as, as African countries at large um, discuss on how to, to benefit from AS from the Africa from the Africa free trade area, and also for ESC, I'm looking to make business friendly, especially in trade. Um, it will be easy for at least for manufacturers across board of finished goods to be able to tap into this huge market. Mm. Tapping into the African market, especially the East African market, is there anything about the language barrier? We're talking about French, DRC, Congo coming on board now. Is there something about the language being done to make sure trade is facilitated among countries in that uh, block? trade but um language barrier will be will be quite something but the beauty is um largely for the east african countries swahili and english are quite prominent and um of course even for drc despite it being quite a french um french um dominated um of course in terms of language in the country um uh, the lucky thing AU signed that swahili will be the official language for africa so i'm hoping they can learn that too but of course um english is quite used even with drc despite I'm um, with French, also quite a population um, communicates with English and also even Kiswahili. So um, the language barrier may, may, may be or may not be an issue, but um, of course, as long as the main thing here now that even the EAC is looking into, first of all, is to, is to standardize and of course to ratify a lot of things, especially in trade, our goods and our people and goods um, able to move freely. And once that is done, I think language barrier will not be really an issue. And of course, um, there are Kenyans who understand French, there are Tanzanians, Ugandans, we will be able to learn. But luckily, um, English Swahili is quite um, a bigger population of East African community understands English and Swahili. 
much, uh, Mercy Milanoi, business journalist in Kenya. It's always good to speak to you, and we'll wait to have you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we'll take a moment now after the break. More stories from the African continent. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Kenya has announced plans to issue bigger treasury bonds as part of a program supported by the World Bank to strengthen the East African nation's domestic debt market. Domestic debt accounts for about half of public borrowing in Kenya. We have Sheila Otieno, investment analyst at Bay Capital in Kenya, with more insights. Hello, uh, Sheila. How are you doing today? Hi, Will. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm okay, doing so well. I hope you are too. Okay, so it's a local currency bond of 50 billion shillings. How is it going to work? I mean, how important are local bonds to support in the Kenya economy? So I will start by answering your second question. That is how important the local bonds are in supporting the Kenyan economy and then about the specific bond itself. So I, assuming that some viewers may not know, I will start by saying that the treasury bonds are usually risk-free investments that typically offer interest rates every six months for its term period, which could be between two to even 30 years. And in Kenya, most bonds that are usually issued are usually fixed interest bonds, which means that the interest rate that you've agreed upon as at issuance is fixed you know it's locked for the duration of the bond it will not change no matter what happens in the market so essentially it's that when you buy a bond what you're doing is lending to the kenyan government yeah and this bond will then be used to finance the budget deficit or maybe an infrastructure for instance like the kenyan budget the 2021-2022 budget that was 34 billion US dollars, the budget deficit was 8.2 billion. And out of this, the government intends to finance 70% from the domestic from domestic from the domestic market that is, yeah. So you, you can see just how important it is. And a large portion of that budget to give perspective is usually allocated, is allocated, was allocated to what the government calls the big four agenda, whose goal was just, is just to promote sustainable economic growth, accelerate job creation with spending areas being universal health care, affordable housing and such. And then for the infrastructure bonds, those are like specific type of bonds that are usually issued for specific infrastructure project and they're also usually not taxed. So you can see just how crucial the bonds are towards supporting the Kenyan economy. Another thing to note is that uh, the local bonds are usually very important to the government because the government gets to borrow cheaply compared when it's borrowing externally. Yeah. So to, to answer the second question just about this bond that is issued in with the World Bank, I would say that it's still now very still not clear what the bond will be used for. Mm -hmm. However, as I earlier mentioned that most of the bonds issued by the Kenyan government are usually either to fund a budget deficit or infrastructure, we think that since the 50 billion bond is going to have a five-year tenor, it's going to be used to fund the government budget deficit. And this is because the infrastructure bonds are usually of longer tenure. So this, this for five years is definitely going to be used to fund a budget deficit and also will really be in line with what the World Bank does, which is issue bonds that are supposed to help countries achieve sustainable development goals. Yeah. So I think I think this is what this bond means. Yes. Yeah, so what expectations, uh, what do we expect uh, investors? How do we expect investors to react to this? What sentiments are we expecting from investors? So currently, investor sentiments in Kenya are very low in the medium term. And this is because attributable to the Finch rating, the one that was issued last week with a negative outlook. And then also the fact that this, this is an election year for Kenya and it's, it's, elections here are really volatile. So there is also rising inflation rates currently, which means that investors will continue to demand for a premium. Though I think that this being the fact that this bond is being issued in collaboration with the World Bank, there might be maybe a slightly improved performance. Yeah, 
And it is also worth noting that the Kenyan government has had like a very huge appetite for debt. And there's been a high number of bonds being issued in the market, which is also raising fears that the private sector is being starved of credit, especially SMEs that I usually work with, you know, so banks will put more money in buying those bonds because obviously they are low risk instead of lending it to the small and medium sized enterprises that actually do need it. So. Thank you so much, Sheila, for that. Sheila Otieno, investment analyst from Bayi Capital. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Will. It was nice being here. Now, the UK has launched a new program to support the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA. Throughout the AFCFTA support program, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, will provide up to £35 million to provide trade facility and trade policy support to the AFCFTA Secretariat and member states through the Trademark East Africa Overseas Development Institute and other regional partners. As the world's largest free trade area, the AFCFTA has the potential to boost Africa's economic growth by driving industrialization. The AFCFTA is also expected to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty, create jobs, and provide new commercial opportunities for businesses across Africa and the UK. The World Bank has approved $560 million loan for Angola to support essential fiscal policy reforms and strengthen statistical capacity in the country. In a statement, the World Bank says $500 million is included in the Development Policy Operation, DPO, the third of a series of three, while the remaining $60 million is to improve the country's statistical capacity. The DPO supports the government of Angola in pursuing key reforms aimed at building stronger foundations for economic diversification, job creation, resilience to climate and economic shocks and poverty reduction. Within the framework of the operation, the World Bank reiterates it will continue to support the Angolan government in achieving more sustainable and inclusive growth through a macro financial and institutional environment led by the private sector. France finance minister says the country will ensure wheat supply to Egypt in the coming months as the war in Ukraine creates supply risks for grain importing countries. Egypt is among the world's biggest wheat importers and is heavily reliant on shipments from Ukraine and Russia and its government has been seeking alternative supplies from countries including India and France. France, the EU's biggest wheat exporter, is an occasional supplier to Egypt. It has faced stiff competition from the Black Sea region that offers wheat which is cheaper and better suited to Egypt's milling standards. Meanwhile, the French government has joined international institutions to warn of a possible food crisis in developing countries in the year ahead if the Ukraine conflict drags on and causes lasting disruption to crop production and exports. Now, South Africa's unemployment rate has increased by 0.4% to 35.3% in the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter of 2021. The number of people who are employed has also increased by 262,000 to 14.5 million. The formal sector accounts for 67.2% of the total employment. Statistics South Africa announced these, that the employment rate among black African population group remains higher than national average and other population groups. Statistician General Minister Mr. Rizenger Maluk Leke says black African women remain vulnerable in the labor market with their unemployment rate at 42.4%. As of uh, the fourth quarter of 2021, we are sitting with uh, the number of those that are unemployed at 7.9 million, representing 35.3%, which is an up from the previous quarter by 0.4 of a percentage point. And indeed, uh, when you look at uh, uh, the expanded definition, you have the 7.9 million people plus the 3.8 million discouraged work seekers and another 800,000 people who would have taken up employment had it been available. And that those come to uh, 12.5 million, which makes our expanded unemployment uh, rate sitting at 46.2%. Beyond that, women, 
particularly black African women, remain vulnerable to labor markets as their unemployment rate is slightly above 42 percent. Which sectors lost jobs? Uh, we are saying that uh, um, the sector of uh, utilities, the sector of manufacturing, the sector of construction. Uh, manufacturing lost about 85,000 jobs, whereas um, uh, construction, which is generally depressed all the time, has lost 25,000 jobs. And that's it on Business Incorporated today. Thanks for watching. I'm Will Ibong. Bye for now.